Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another live edition of Miked Up Sports, the show that goes in depth with the people who build our sports community. If you're watching us live on Facebook, thanks for joining us. Feel free to drop a comment on the live stream, and there's a good chance we may read it on the air. And if you're watching this on demand through our YouTube channel, we're glad you can join us as well. Joining me is a former basketball athlete, and I say former because she graduated a couple of years ago from South Dakota State University. She scored a total of 512 career points, started 56 games. Now she is making moves as an entrepreneur. Alexis Alexander, a Miss Basketball finalist from Champlin Park and a member of one of the most prestigious AAU teams that I can remember. Alexis, thanks for joining us. And how has your journey of entrepreneurship been going for you since you made that transition? Um, it's been going good. It's fun. It's just, it's just another journey, right? Being an athlete, you have to learn to be disciplined. Um, so it's just, you know, taking that fire, that discipline and putting it, putting that energy into another source. So it's been fun. I'm growing, I'm learning and, you know, got a lot to go from here. We were talking a little bit beforehand, you're self-employed, so mm -hmm. that gives you more flexibility as opposed to working a nine to five or a corporate or a regular gig. But at the same time, uh, you have to create your own opportunities. So you've got yeah. to grind in ways that others who hold traditional jobs don't. What are the challenges with that? And what have you enjoyed most about this journey of being <laughs> Yeah. a do-it-yourself type of specialist? Um, honestly, it's just, it's just, to me, it's about creativity. I feel like um, upon graduating, kind of getting out of the athletic world, um, it's been giving me a, a new way to find my creativity. I felt like when I was growing up, I was so focused on one thing, and that was basketball, basketball, basketball. Um, so this, you know, being able to do this and get into right now, I'm, you know, I'm working with businesses and helping close for them, but then I also have, um, a digital, um, marketing company that I'm trying to get off the ground. So it's just in video content and docu documentaries that I'm, you know, diving into. So it's just a lot of creativity that I'm able to get into now. So I guess the biggest thing is I'm challenging myself to do something that I didn't you know, grow up doing, I, it wasn't something I was used to. So, you know, just something completely new is, is the biggest challenge. Well, if you need any help with video content, that is one of my specialties, as you might have seen over the years, whether you were watching high school games of your buddies or down the road. So yeah. I can give you a couple pointers when we're done with this, if you'd like. Awesome. I appreciate that. Yes. Any, any knowledge I can get is always welcomed. And I feel the same way. Uh, I don't like to talk about myself often, especially on, on these podcasts, but one thing about myself is I'm willing to admit that I'm smart enough to know that I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. All right. Just being teachable, right? That's, that's the biggest thing. Um, be an expert with the beginner's mentality. So that's kind of how I am approaching life. By no means an expert. <laughs> You're getting there though, right? You know, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Just growing, still learning. That's why I said you're getting there. You see, I that way, I didn't want to claim you're an expert. I just said you're getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because then you'll have the mindset of getting one step closer. No, I, I can tell already, yeah, you... You could be an expert on the fields of study that you're pursuing and still want to learn more. It sounds like you have that drive to always be open to learning new things. Yeah, it's just about growing, right? What is that saying? If you're not growing, you're dying. So just constantly trying to grow. Well, let's hope we don't die anytime soon. Yeah, right. <laughs> You spoke of moving on from basketball after you finished your college career, but for a long time, basketball was your life. You had a successful career at Champlin Park and you did well at South Dakota State. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, when did you get started in the sport of basketball? Do you recall the moment that got you hooked on the sport? Um, <laughs> that 
That's a great question. Um, I don't know if I know the exact age. I know I was probably around like five or so. And so if you knew my game, you knew I was definitely like defense was my area of specialty um, and then also distributor. Um, but if we look back at my history and really thinking about it, um, my introduction to basketball was when my dad used to he used to tell me if we were ever with his friends or family, he'd say, Lex, get in your defensive stance. And then I'd get in my defensive stance and he'd point one direction and then I'd shuffle and point the other direction and I'd shuffle. So um, I guess it's just little things like that. I learned to do defense before I started touching a ball, right? Um, so I guess if I can think of my first memory, it's just getting in my defensive stance. Um, but then I remember, you know, I played in those little Brooklyn Park rec leagues. So um, I can't remember what age that was though. So I'm going to say maybe fourth grade is when, you know, we started in those, those Brooklyn Park leagues. <laughs> and I was doing a little bit of research about you before this podcast. And as you were growing up, uh, something that you were disappointed about is that you would not match the height of one of your idols in Candace uh -oh. Parker. <laughs> Man, I remember when they told, when the doctor told me I wasn't going to be 6'3", I started bawling in the, in the doctor's office. I had dreams, high hopes, but yeah, that was a disappointment. But I'm good now. Trust me, I'm, not, I'm okay with my height. I was going to say, I, I don't think you have any insecurities about your stature now, but I, I find it amusing and not in the sense of, oh, ha ha, you were shorter than you wanted to be. But back then, you know, do you recall why it was so disappointing to you that you weren't going to be six feet or taller? Yeah, it's just Candace Parker was my idol. <laughs> so um, Candace Parker, 6'3". Taylor Hill was one of my favorite basketball players when she was in high school. So I think what she's like 5'11". So everybody was just kind of, you know, taller than I'm about, I'm 5'5". I'm five, five. Um, five, five and a half. I like to say five, six in college. We said five, seven. I was not five, seven. Um, but it was just because, you know, people who I looked up to that played were taller. So I wanted to be that height. But when I got older, like college, high school, I didn't feel short. So even college, right? We got my teammates are like six foot, six, three. I never felt little. I was little, so don't get me wrong. I, I am little compared to them, but I never felt like I was just super um, tiny amongst the rest of the crowd. Um, and I don't, I don't know why, what confidence came from just always being around tall people, but I adjusted quickly. I would like to think it was your defense. I like to think so. <laughs> you may not be as tall as your teammates or opponents, but your defense... Uh gave them a run for their money. So opponents, especially when they had to go against you, they knew they couldn't underestimate you, even if you stood at five, five and a half, because otherwise you would uh, get the jump on them, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. I was definitely trying to be everywhere all the time on defense. And, you know, I would, you know, people think because I'm standing there, they don't have to jump for a rebound. I would jump up to go get a rebound. So I would, I was all over the place. And I think that you're probably right. That's why I didn't, feel so small and you talked about jumping for a rebound a late colleague of mine he died last month but he and I crossed paths for a year when he was a part of the Lynx PR team a former basketball player he stands at six foot seven and we would talk shop while we were waiting for interviews but something he said and I remember this vividly to this day when I call games that height can help when it comes to rebounding defense, but it's also about positioning, floor mm -hmm. awareness. And if you know how to use yourself, if you know where to place yourself, you can compensate for being shorter than your assignment. Yeah, exactly. Just moving, constantly moving too. You discussed how you became more comfortable with your body type as you got older. And I heard of you, not just from what you did at Champlain Park, but 
from being a member of an AAU team that included Chase Coley, Tia Elbert, Tanoa Wade, Kanisha Bell, Kanisha now, now playing professionally, Caleb McMorris playing professionally, but you know, one of your teammates was as tall as you are in Tia. So did that help you get acclimated or become more comfortable because you saw that here is another athlete who is just as dynamic as you are and has her own talents, the two of you are roughly the same height and both of you prove that you don't have to be giant behemoths to contribute. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that helped. It's just, you know, we, we all have different games, right? And it's, it's about what you contribute. I wasn't, me and Tia weren't meant to be on the floor to be the big post in the center. Um, so yeah, it helped because just, you know, all knowing what we had to offer, right? What was our role on the team? So, you know, T and I, we had similar roles. We were able to push each other in that role that we had. And then, you know, you have Tano and Chase who are taller and they're able to battle under the basket. So yeah, it's just understanding your role, understanding the position that you have. I had Tia and Kayla on my podcast over the last couple of years, and they both remember fondly of how tight that group was. Chase came in as a senior, but it felt like she'd been there for years. A lot of AAU teams go back and forth. You'll see players jump around organizations, and you kind of see that now with high schools too. But your group stuck together throughout your club years. Yeah. What helped you – stay together and what did you enjoy most about being a part of that group that represented some of the top players of the 2014 class um so even to this day like those are my sisters and I think that is due to you know the coaching that we've had um my dad was one of the coaches to know his dad was a coach you know Percy Jamal when we started at Farview and kind of migrated towards AU to uh, to you know the AU scene I think it was just our coaches kept us together our coaches kept us close-knit um we had we did everything together so it wasn't just basketball we're hanging out all the time so it's hard to you know break up a group like this that you know we find ourselves as being sisters right um our our parents are getting along our coaches kept us together um, we do everything together. So it was just a family and you can't, it's hard to break up a family. I'm curious, what did you contribute to the team? And I don't mean that as a knock, but everyone, as you said, it, it had a family atmosphere. They all had their own vibes. Tia was the trash talker. Like if she had a big game, she's told me this frequently. If she ever scores 40, you were going to hear about it. Uh, Kayla being a dynamic scorer, Kanisha, I know she was a dynamic player as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your role? What did you add to that team that maybe wouldn't have been there yeah. if you weren't a part of it? Um, so for me, I was more, I was the sound player. Like everybody would have, you know, get super hype or sometimes people would get super low. I was always a very even kill type of player. Um, so I, I guess you could say I brought the soundness to the team. I was, you know, more of a distributor. So, you know, got the ball to the right people. So overall, it was more so, you know, keeping the team at a level place. Because I, I feel like that's key, right? If you have people who can get hype and, you know, get the momentum going, well, you know, sometimes it could also go in the opposite direction. So it's, it's important to have that energy to be able to just stay centered as well. And I think a couple of years ago, I saw a photo shoot from when you guys got together, had the North Tartan reunion. I think that was your club, if I'm correct. Yeah, I was at North Tartan, yeah. North Tartan. So as you said, there's a sisterhood that still exists. Yeah. What are some moments or memories, whether it was playing on the club circuit at Farview and North Tartan, or even your get togethers when you guys bring the band back together to quote the Blues Brothers? <laughs> yeah. What are some moments or memories from your time in AAU with your fellow North Tartan teammates? Um, we have a lot. That's hard to, to narrow it down. Obviously, you know, we have the big ones where we won nationals. So nationals was fun. It was a good time. Um, a few nationals, actually. 
um, being in Florida at, what was it, the Disney, Disney World, whatever, I can't remember what it's called. Um, and then also Branson, it's just like the, the things we did outside of the the tournaments you know um but then also we had moments where we'd go see each other play you know going to Kanisha's games when everybody was home um now it is kind of hard for everybody to get together because we're all you know living in different areas Tia's in a different state Noah's in a different state um so when everybody's home in Minnesota it's nice to get together but I guess that's just part of growing up right everybody's spread out but I guess the biggest memory where I can really recall all of us the last memory I can recall most of us or all of us being together was um Kanisha's game you know when she was still playing so a few years ago so it's been a minute since all of us have been able to really get together well I'm sure when it's safe to gather again uh, I can only imagine what that next North Tartan reunion is going to be like <laughs> Yeah, it'll be fun. I miss everybody. So hopefully it will happen soon. COVID will, you know, go somewhere. <laughs> right. Fingers crossed. I forgot this is Zoom. And so if you didn't see, uh, and I know on a personal note, I'm sitting out from covering games in person until I get vaccinated for that very reason, because I don't want to make the situation worse than it already is. Uh, but you spoke of how everyone has scattered. And I find it intriguing how everyone has taken on different avenues in their careers. You and Tia are looking to establish yourselves as self entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and perhaps providing a beacon or foundation or examples that women of color can enter these fields like everyone else can. I know there has been talked about a lack of those faces, a lack of visibility in that area. You know, Kayla playing professionally and still going strong at it. Kanisha, as you noted, got a chance to play, got to be part of the Minnesota Lynx roster for a few games. Uh, Chase is doing her thing. Tanoa, I think, is getting into modeling. So I find it intriguing how all of you shared this talent in basketball, and now you've all carried that into different career fields mm -hmm. yeah all my girls are out here doing it um and like you said you know with people of color trying to get into the entrepreneur type of space I feel like it's you know it's really taking off right now just I feel like the platform for people of color is really starting to find a voice and, and really going somewhere so you know even I don't know if you remember Maddie on the team Maddie Lee um, Maranatha, right? Yep, Maranatha. Maddie has her own business. So a lot of us are, you know, kind of trying to start our own thing. Um, and it will definitely be cool once we can all come together and bring that into, you know, collaborate in some space. But yeah, we're all out here, you know, trying to get our, our own thing off the ground. Um, for the most part, I, I think most of us are trying the entrepreneur route. In fact, I think I met Maddie the same time I met you at the inner city all-star classic all those years ago. Yeah. <laughs> because I think your entire AAU team actually got to take part in it. Yeah. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. On the high school side, you went to Champlin park. It's not a school that is synonymous with basketball in the same vein as Hopkins or Minneapolis North or Minneapolis South. You mentioned Taylor Hill earlier. What led you to Champlin Park? I live in I live in Brooklyn Park. <laughs> so so okay, so it was geography. Yeah, by where I live. Um yeah. You could have gone to Park Center though. I could have. You could have been teammates talked. with Kayla. I know. I and I had talked about it so many times. I wanted to go to Ch um Park Center to play with Kayla, but um we had we had a good AU team, so you know, the focus was staying where I was at, staying at Champlain, um, and then, you know, doing what I could do on my high school team. And then when our AAU team got together, you know, that's that's where things really would take off in terms of getting in front of coaches and, and things like that. So, you know, it is what it is. Champlain was cool. Like I, I, I enjoyed playing with the, the 
women that I played with. So it was still a great experience. And I tease, of course, in case you're wondering, obviously you are more than your accolades would say in the high school and college ranks. That being said, since you and Kayla were conference rivals in the high school season, I'm guessing you went up against some of your other teammates as well throughout your high school career. How surreal was that? Did that amp you up knowing when you got Park Center on the schedule, which meant you got a chance to face off against a fellow yeah. D1 talent? Kayla was the only teammate that we played that I'm thinking that I can think of. Cause I never played, you know, Kennedy, never played Chardon, um, Maranatha. So I, I think I, we might've played Maranatha in like a summer league. Oh, I think we might've played Kennedy in the summer league, but it was never, we never, the only team we ever played was Kayla and we played them like two times a year. So it was always exciting. Probably the most exciting game of the year. Um, the most exciting games of the season. I mean, um, but yeah, it was always, it was fun. It's just like, you're, you're playing your teammate, your AU teammate. And like I said, we're, it's like a family, like these are my sisters. So it's like, I'm playing my sister. Right. Uh, so it was, it was just always fun. Um, being able to go up against Kayla, go up against K-Mag. We, were, we weren't the same position though. So we didn't guard each other as much either. That's okay. Because I think you would have, uh, you would have taken it to her, right? You would have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Taylor already knows. Like, yeah, it was probably good because otherwise you would have embarrassed or humiliated Kayla and she never would have set foot on the court again. You would have had your way, right? Kayla would have got, Kayla would have got that work. I don't know if she wouldn't, she wouldn't have set foot on the court again, but yeah, Kayla, Kayla don't want this. Call. <laughs> and I have a feeling if we brought Kayla back on, she would say the same about you <laughs> because you're those kinds of players. We do have a couple of comments uh, on the Facebook live stream from Derek Turner, who has been a coach for a long time. And he has fond memories of that Farview EEU team that you had. Yeah. And he just remembered how much he loved watching all of you play. Yeah. Hi, hi Coach Turner. <laughs> hi, Dern. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I'll get to see him at Roseville when it's safe again. And that's where he is now uh, with Tanisha Scott, the former state champion coach from De La Salle. Mm -hmm. so do you recall you didn't play against each other in terms of position but who would you say got the better end of those matchups between you and Kayla in Northwest Suburban Conference play you know I should know this if you ask my dad my dad will know these facts down to a T he remembers exactly what moves somebody did five yeah um but I want to say Oh, you know what? I think we did. I think we did probably her senior year. They probably, I think they beat us twice. No, I think we might've split. I think our senior year we split, but I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna talk out of the side of my neck and say we did. I'm making it up. I'm not even sure. <laughs> Join us for our next episode when Kayla issues her rebuttal. Right. <laughs> now, you didn't have the same postseason success that maybe Kanisha did or Kayla did. Kayla got to win a state championship in 3A. Kanisha got a chance to play in a couple of state finals. That being said, you did end your high school career as a Miss Basketball finalist. You were the leading scorer at Champlin Park. So your defense, your offense, all of that, they were certainly being recognized. Uh, what do you remember most about your high school career and how that helped you develop into the citizen you are now? Um, my high school career, it was one of those things where even when I was like a freshman going in, I was still seen as, you know, one of the top players on the team. So going in, I... I had to develop leadership, you know, even being, you know, one of the younger players on the team, still having to develop some type of captain mentality, some type of leadership mentality. So that's helped me um, in that sense. It's helped me to, you know, even when, when I got to college, right. Um, 
I didn't have the whole, you know, state championship experience, but I did have, you know, three years out of my four, we went to the NCAA tournament, right? So it's just like, I had great experiences with basketball. Um, each, each experience has taught me a lot. I've learned to, you know, be a leader when I didn't feel like I was a leader, right? When I, I had to develop that mentality, I had to find some type of feisty, feistiness inside of me. I'm, I'm not like a, um, a trash talking person, right? Like, like we mentioned earlier, that wasn't my role on the team, but that's something I had to kind of get that dog mentality when I was playing with Champlin versus when I was with North Tartan, I didn't have, that wasn't my role. I didn't have to have that kind of dog mentality. I did when I was with Champlin because I had to be that leader that would bring that out of everybody else. And also I found that that was something that I kind of had to bring out at South Dakota State. So it's just like trying to find different elements of yourself, even when you don't feel like it's within you, there's a piece like you can find that, you know, feistiness, that dog mentality, you can, um, you know, be even kill every once in a while. So it's just playing around with that mindset of just being a leader and, you know, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so when you had to take on more of that trash talk persona, did you hit Tia up for advice? <laughs> no, <laughs> I probably should have. I probably should have. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she could still give you some pointers now. <laughs> Man, my thing <laughs> the is if I would hit her up with advice, she would have just been talking trash to me the whole time. And I wasn't looking for that. <laughs> I was looking for lessons. I didn't oh. need <laughs> She's going to have a word with me when she sees this <laughs> with all the smack talk we're giving about her trash talk. I wish I was there to see it. Uh, I didn't, I don't cover a lot of summer ball because usually around that time, that's when I would be on the link speed. Yeah. Uh, well, well I, I suppose I, I can't complain too much because, you know, I got to be on hand for a four time WNBA champion. So yeah, I probably shouldn't <laughs> gripe about that too much. Yeah. Had some good experiences too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now you were a Miss Basketball finalist. I can't remember who was in that group. I know Carly Wagner won. Mm -hmm. I want to say Kayla, maybe Tia were on that list as well. I don't know if you remember, but when you got that honor, Carly Wagner winning it, maybe not a surprise, but you still were recognized for your accomplishments, for your skills, even if you never got to a state tournament, what did that mean for you? Uh, it meant a lot. It was recognition for, um, you know, something where I felt like, why would I be recognized, right? I didn't take my team to state or anything like that. So I think it was just cool to kind of get that recognition, um, even though, you know, I wasn't able to go to state with my team. Um, so it was a cool, it was, it was still a great experience. I was recognized for the hard work I did put in beside, you know, on the court outside of, you know, practice, the, the extra work we would put in, the weekends we would spend playing ball, the summers we spent playing ball. So, you know, it was just, it was just rewarding to kind of get that recognition. Do you remember who was a finalist with you that year? <laughs> I told you, I don't remember any. <laughs> You don't remember anything. Um, your, your dad probably would though, right? My dad would know all of it. I should like message him. Hold on. <laughs> so <laughs> live up to the minute research, folks. That is what this podcast is all about as we share oral history. So while Alexis messages her father, if you don't mind, Alexis. Yeah. Even yeah. though you didn't win it, and you didn't go to state, you still got offers to play in Division One, And of course, you would play in Division One at South Dakota State. And as you mentioned, you reached the NCAA tournament three times. South Dakota State, they're, 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 they've got a track record for that. Yeah. Being one of those upset specials in mm -hmm. the mid-majors. But if you recall, when did you get your first offer? And how many offers did you field before you settled on South Dakota State? I got my first offer, I believe the summer of my sophomore year. Um, I didn't go on very many visits. Um, 
So I didn't go on very many visits, um, but I think I went on maybe three visits and then I settled with South Dakota. I didn't settle. It wasn't a settle. Let me take that back. I did not settle. <laughs> you you, you, you settled for a school that only went to the NCAA yeah. tournament three times in your college career. I, I, if that's settling, that's probably why you're in entrepreneurship now, because <laughs> if that's your version of settling, I wish <laughs> then if that's your version of settling, I would hate to think what your no. uh, version of, of going for it is. It definitely wasn't settling. It was, it when I went there, you know, South Dakota State has always been a great, not, it has always been a great basketball program. You know, even before I got there, they've been to the tournament. They've been a competitive um, program. AJ has been a good coach. So it was definitely a no brainer, especially because it was so close to home and it was, away from my parents to be able to travel to the game. So yeah, South Coast State, it wasn't a settle by no means. <laughs> what led you to pick South Dakota State? And I say pick because you didn't settle as you made it clear. What led you to choose South Dakota State? Um, After I went on a visit, I just, I guess I could see what my role was to be. I felt like, I could be a key player for South Dakota State's team. So I think it was just, it was just seeing that one, I could be a key player to, for a team that is very successful, usually goes to the tournament. Um, I had a great experience meeting the, the woman on the team. Um, the coaches obviously knew what they were doing. They were great coaches. So I just figured this was a chance to take, you know, my, my basketball experience to the next level to be able to, you know, go to the tournament. That's something I feel like everybody dreams of when they're, when they're in high school, when they're kids, they watch the March Madness tournaments. So it just felt like a real possibility to do that and also be a, a key component to doing that. I didn't feel like I would just ride the bench. <laughs> Well, as we noted in the open, you didn't ride the bench. You were a starter for most of your last two seasons, started every game as a senior, and you know, maybe didn't rack up the points like you might have at Champlain Park. You know, it wasn't like you were stuffing the stat sheet, but you were contributing from the first game all the way through your last game. Yeah. What do you remember from your South Dakota State experience? I remember the atmosphere like South Dakota State fans are like no other I promise you the games were usually always filled even when we would go out of state our fans would travel like when we went to Vegas we had more fans in Vegas than the home team so I, I think the biggest thing was just the the following South Dakota State definitely the fans really bring it and that's something that I don't think I could have got anywhere else unless I was like at Notre Dame or something. <laughs> but like that falling was insane and it was awesome. And as you mentioned, you went to the NCAA tournament three times. Mm -hmm. Off the top of my head, I can't remember how far you went, but I know South Dakota State over the years has inched progressively better and better. I think they made a splash a couple of years ago. Yeah, that was the year after I graduated. They went to the uh Sweet 16. Was it the Sweet 16? They I didn't... believe it was Sweet 16. Yeah. Yep, they got to the Sweet 16. They went off. Yeah, it was awesome. And they were knocking on the door before when you were there. Mm -hmm. And so even though you don't have a Sweet 16 to your credit, you know, making the tournament is still an accomplishment no matter how far you go. I mean, I'm sure you'd all love to make the final four. Who wouldn't? But right. get there. you mentioned you got to be a part of those tournaments after playing a high school career where you never got to the big dance. So how special was that for you to see your development, your contributions, your effort, your investment as a player, getting you opportunities to get into the tournament that everyone wants to be a part of when the season mm -hmm. starts? It was awesome. It was awesome. Um, and I, I will say, I by no means think that's, I'll say this, I know there's more I could have done. I feel like if I was, I, there was a focus that was lost when I got to college. Um, 
So there are some instances where I wish I would have put, you know, more time in the gym and extra workouts when I got to college. Um, and then also just being grateful for the opportunity that's in front of you. I feel like a lot of times we get somewhere and, you know, we're always looking at the grass is greener kind of mentality. Um, so I will say that's something that I wish I would have been more aware of. Um, just seeing the opportunity in front of me, you know, taking advantage of the opportunity in front of me and, and expressing more gratitude. So I could have done more, I know it, but at the same time, it was still a great experience. What did you enjoy most about attending school there? I know a lot of Minnesota recruits go yeah. to play for the Jackrabbits and they're still attracting uh, students. Callie Tyson from YZ, and I think Cindy Stapleton from Centennial. You know, Maddie Giebert went there from Eastview. A lot of big name Minnesota kids go to that school. You are part of that list, but at the same time, it's a mid major. So you maybe don't get the publicity that UConn or Notre Dame, Baylor, some of the blue bloods would. What did you enjoy most about your experience and helping establish this tradition of excellence that has placed South Dakota state among the teams to watch now? Um, so even though you're not a celebrity around the country, when you're in South Dakota, you are a celebrity. Um, so I would say it's just how invested the fans are into you. Um, you know, people love watching women's basketball in South Dakota. So the competition between, you know, SDSU and USD was always great. That was, those were always exciting games. So the biggest thing is it is a it is a small community so I did enjoy that I enjoyed how small it was and how much support you got from um, the community around you people, you know, you have little girls coming up to you wanting to be like you, um, especially somebody like me, the only woman of color on the team. So then you'll have little girls who was like I've never seen anybody like you on the South Dakota State team and then, you know, being able to be that figure for them was amazing so. Um, the biggest thing, I guess, is the support, you know, from the community. That was huge. And as we alluded to, you weren't alone. You had several other Minnesota kids yeah. go to South Dakota State, including Maddie Giebert, mm -hmm. this basketball in 2015. How did that help you acclimate? Like you said, you weren't that far away, so your family could watch you play. Uh -huh. and, and even though you were the only woman of color on that team, you weren't the only Minnesota athlete. So you could have that shared experience with the other Minnesota kids who committed to the Jackrabbits. How do you think that helped you? Uh, it helped because, you know, we, we understand the, you know, we came from the same scenario, same competition. We can talk about, you know, players that we, you know, players that we went up against we had similar experiences in that sense um and then you know have rides home when I needed a ride home or if they needed a ride home we could uh, uh carpool so that was always good so just little things in common like you know coming from the metro area and I want to follow up on something you said on how much you resonated with the South Dakota State community being the only woman of color on the South Dakota State women's team. And we may not think of the Dakotas as a melting pot compared to <laughs> hubs like Atlanta, New York, Los Angeles, yeah. but you were the example. And from what you're telling me, you wore that with pride. So to have fans come up to you and share how much it meant to see someone who looked like them play division one basketball. How did you take that in? Oh, that was a, that was an awesome experience. That's probably like one of my, you know, favorite experiences, just being like, you're, you're a role model for somebody, right? You're, um, you're kind of paving a way for, for little girls who, didn't see themselves in that position. So honestly, it's been a great experience. And I feel like that's, you know, one of the reasons, or at least something that drives me is being able to do something for other people, right? Coming from a place of service. So even if that service is, 
you know, kind of opening a little girl's eyes to the potential um, just because she lives in a small town in South Dakota and, you know, doesn't see very many people who look like her, she can still do so much, right? She could still go play Division One basketball. So it, it, honestly, that was probably my favorite experience, the best experience I've had. And just to better illustrate the significance of Alexis's membership on South Dakota State, the campus in Brookings, also the headquarters of Dactronics, uh, <laughs> which I'm guessing uh, is prevalent at South Dakota State's home arena in terms of video boards. But as of the most recent census, the city of Brookings, 92% white, 1.1% African-American. So there it is. <laughs> it, it, it's just, I say that to highlight yeah. why Alexis's spot on the team was significant, as yeah. you said, in South Dakota, it's not like growing up in Brooklyn Park, Minneapolis, or going around AAU. You're probably used to that. I mean, look at just look at your AAU team, for example. So a huge shift for you. I don't know how long it took for you to adapt to those surroundings, but from what you're telling me, you made the most of it. And who knows whether it's in Brookings or elsewhere, you know, there could be a future Alexis Alexander that you impacted just by being yourself. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's something that you adjust to, but I will say, you know, coming from Minnesota, I feel like there are a lot of people who, you know, are able to more easily adjust to that because, I mean, if you look at Minnesota, and even on my basketball team, I think there were probably two women, of, our, our school was more diverse, but on the basketball team itself, there were probably, I think, two of us, two people of color, women of color on the team. Uh, maybe three here and there. It fluctuated throughout the year. But so I say that to say is, you know, predominantly black was my AAU team, but everything else was, it was something that, you know, I had to acclimate to, you know, my whole life. So for me, it wasn't, it wasn't that difficult. It was kind of an adjustment. There were times where I did feel, you know, kind of like, lonelier in that aspect um but it is something that I did grow up having to adjust to and I will say I also think it you know it's one of those things where every experience you grow from every experience so I was put in that position for a reason because you know obviously I'm supposed to be able to you know be a bridge right so I don't know, something that you adjust to, either you can adjust to it or you can't adjust to it. I grew up adjusting to it, so it was easier for me. Just like how you adjusted to being shorter than you wanted to be, right? Okay, yep, <laughs> just, like, just like the height challenges. <laughs> Looking back, it's been a couple of years now since you hung up the jersey from a competitive standpoint, but with the influence you had, not just as a player going to three NCAA championships, but being the role model for future athletes, especially for people of color in places that are racially homogenous. Mm -hmm. When you consider everything you were able to see and witness and influence from your journey, what do you remember most fondly about your time as a division one student athlete? What do I remember the most? Um, I would say just, um, I feel like there's a lot I remember. I feel like that's where I had the most, I learned so much. Um, I think one of the things was I, everything came from growth, right? So learning to adjust, learning to be in an environment where you're on your own. Um, I will say a lot of people, for me, I didn't know anybody at South Dakota, right? I didn't come to a school where I had other friends who were coming here. I, I, I was the only person I knew going to South Dakota State. So learning to be on my own, um, learning to just grow with the speed of the game. Um, you know, I think one of the things you'll hear from anybody when they're asking, okay, what's something big you learn when you're going from college basketball to high school or high school to college? The speed of the game, obviously that changes, right? That picks up, but it's also learning to 
operate on a less inner or less um, rest, right? So you're going from school to practice um, to another workout, back to class. So you you're you're not resting as much as you probably would like. Um, so it's just learning to work off of less energy. Um, but I guess the biggest memory that I had is just the excitement of the games. The excitement, excitement there is something that I can't ever replace. And I feel like as you're, you're leaving college basketball, as you're leaving sports, you're like, you, where would you ever get that experience? Where would you ever be able to have, you know, thousands of people cheering for you unless you're like some motivational speaker or celebrity or something? But like that doesn't, you don't really get that anymore, right? So it's just, that's probably the number one experience taken away from that, just feeling like, you know, you have all these people who are like cheering for you. You never know, Alexis, you could find yourself a celebrity again and have thousands of people cheering for you as you uh, hey. build your profile <laughs> as an entrepreneur. <laughs> you never know. I could be the next Oprah. Someone's gotta be, right? <laughs> Yeah. You may not be the first Oprah, but you could be the second. Could be the second. So, <laughs> so look out, folks. <laughs> hey, go. I mean, if that's what you want to do, go for it. Uh, <laughs> just, just save a spot for me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few things I wanted to uh, talk about with you as you speak of the adjustments and the challenges probably the biggest one having to play with a shot clock, for mm -hmm. example, in terms of the game, but how do you think that experience as a college athlete helped you grow as an individual? Not at, since you had a chance to see what communities, what life is like in areas where the population isn't as diverse as you were used to growing up in AAU and playing in the Northwest suburban, being in the Minneapolis suburb. It sounds like that helped enhance your worldview. Um, I guess it, yeah, it kind of enhanced my worldview. It made me realize I, there's so much more that I need to see. I need to travel more. I've been in the Midwest my entire life. So I'm in a place where I got to go. You got to get me out of here. Um, and it, I will say, like, it's something I feel like, you know, people of color, especially the Midwest, will experience is I or for me, I can only speak for myself. I have yet to be in an environment or a state where I am like, where I just blend in, right? Like where everybody's predominantly Black. So for me, like, that wasn't something where I felt like I was really growing. Cause I feel like that's what I've been used to for a long time. I feel like that place of growth is if I went to like Africa or, you know, if I moved to DC or Atlanta, that's where I feel like, you know, I've never been in this type of environment. Um, so in terms of growth, I do feel like I'm, I guess I would say I'm being, I'm learning to I don't know, like the growth is just learning to continue to be me, right? Continue to, you know, not have to um, blend in with everybody else. Like, I'm okay with that. I don't have to be like everybody else. So growing up in that type of environment, I'm cool. I can be who I am, confident in who I am. Um, and I've learned to, I think in my experience, there was so many times where I tried to blend in. And now it's like, I don't, care to do that anymore well i would say being yourself has worked out pretty well when you look at <laughs> your accomplishments as an athlete being an entrepreneur now running your own business so i'd say you're following the right path by being yourself yeah yeah i'm still figuring it out right i, I think we're always constantly figuring out you know who we are um yeah so constantly growing now, on the more biographical side, yes. looking back in your athletic career, you can take this any way you'd like. What was your most exciting moment and what was your most embarrassing moment? <laughs> My most exciting moment would be, um, who was it? So we played, I think it was 
northern Iowa and I hit like a, a buzzer beater. So that was exciting. That was probably one of my most exciting or yeah, that was probably one of the most exciting. Was that when you had 11 fourth quarter points in your senior season? Is it might was that one? It, it, I'm just I'm looking at some of it and I'm wondering, I wonder if it was that one. Yeah. But hey, you came up clutch. Yeah. I think that was I think that was probably one of the best ones. My most my most embarrassing one was my last game ever in college basketball. It was like the last shine. I think it could have like tied the game and I airballed. <laughs> So that was like probably my most embarrassing. Um, but again, it's not even like, I don't dwell on those embarrassing moments. We all have, you know, we all have those. So that if I had to think of one, that was probably it. Was that the Villanova game? Yep. That was Villanova. And, and I'm looking at that. Uh, and I could see how that would be embarrassing because that one went to overtime that was my last college shot. And so if you make that shot, maybe you get the upset or get the win. And instead, yeah. Villanova wins an OT. So I could see how you would feel. Yep. You probably felt pretty hard on yourself after that, I'm guessing. I did. Yeah, it was. I mean, there were so many ways I wish I would have shown up more in that game. Um, so then for me to airball. And like I said, that was my last college shot. <laughs> so I ended my career with an airball. Um, so that was probably, I mean, the most embarrassing, but it wasn't something I, it wasn't like days after I was dwelling on it. It was, you know, it makes sense in the moment you're feel like crap. I talk to players all the time. If they have a bad game, they're hard on themselves because you, you want to play well. And you know, like in your heart, in your head, you think you're feeling like I could have done better than this, but like you, I think you got, it's a game and you knew you're going to be defined by more than just one game. And this yeah. take it from somebody, I was on hand to cover the only game where Maya Moore failed to score a point. Oh, you didn't so, cover it? No, I did. Like oh. I, it was her rookie season and yeah. I was, it was when I was still a beat writer and I bring that story up just to remind people that even the best players have their off Oh, yeah. games they're all performances i mean yeah. uh, maya moore not scoring a point if you were to bring that up everybody would think you're crazy right or like how is that possible yeah so yeah i could see how you'd want to do a little better but hey you know, <laughs> there's so many experiences like I've, I've had weird falls like you know what i mean so there's like so, there's so many there's too many to count but there's also so many great experiences you know winning championships buzzer beaters like there's so much. So it's all, it's just all great stuff. That's what I was getting at. And I can see you remember the good times too. And, and you know, being an athlete, that's going to happen. You're going to have good games. You're going to have moments you wish you could run back, but you're playing a sport that involves split second thinking, timing, decision-making, all of that. You have to go through a myriad of possibilities while the game is playing out. So an air ball is going to happen once in a while. I think basketball players are some of the best athletes because you got to run, jump. You got to have quick bursts of speed. You know, you got to be able to slide. I, I always will <laughs> think. And then you have to have this endurance. Basketball, we're athletes, man. <laughs> You may not be an athlete by title, but in spirit, I can see some other things I wanted to explore. I had an old copy of the breakdown book, and I'm curious to see if this still holds up. In that book, you said that one of your favorite hobbies is reading and mm -hmm. that your father gave you the nickname Buddhas. <laughs> yes, my dad still calls me Buddhas. Um, and yeah, I read every day. Like I read, I have three different books I'm reading right now. So yeah, it's still one of my favorite hobbies. How did the nickname Buddhas come to be? I have no idea. I just know that. It's, <laughs> honestly, I couldn't even tell you. That's just something he's always called me. Speaking of books, one of your favorites that perhaps has helped you mm -hmm. in this field as a self-established entrepreneur, and this surprised me when I read it, how Successful People Win by Ben Stein. Yeah. I would not have expected 
that to be one of your top choices because I know Ben Stein, a lot of us know him from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. I remember him from when Ben Stein's Muddy, the comedy central version of Jeopardy that he was a part of. Mm -hmm. So he is a, an individual I respect because he knows a lot and however you feel about him personally, it, 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 I have to take him into consideration and somebody who was clever enough to take his persona, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, he ad-libbed that entire economics lecture <laughs> from the film, which speaks to his memory recall and intelligence. But what led you, <laughs> how did that book become significant for you? So honestly, that book changed my life and the guy who gave it to me. And you know what's so unfortunate? I can't even remember the guy's name. Um, but it was a gentleman who gave me this book. He worked at Walmart. He was a greeter at Walmart. And, you know, going in, I would always say hi to him, smile at him, say hi. And then one day he stopped me, had a conversation, you know, said he, he felt like, you know, I'm a nice person. I'm meant to do, you know, a lot of great things and good things for, for other people. So then he gave me this book. He gave me this book and I was like, I didn't read it for like a few months. And then I finally just opened it up because he would ask me about it. And then I finally opened it up and I plowed through that book. Like I, I was going to see if I could find it real quick, but I have so many notes still in it and papers just sticking out everywhere. And I think that was the first book that just opened my eyes to the potential of like, you know, what we can do, like what people can do if they just have the right mindset. Um, so that one just, it just got me on this, this path of, you know, how important your mindset is to, you know, be successful. And, um, but it just really changed my life. Cause I never was really thinking about the growth and the potential and how you can impact people and how much greatness you can have inside of you. I didn't think about any of that. I was focused on basketball. So then once he showed me that book, my whole reality shifted, right? So then that's when I started getting on this whole wave of now I read all types of books. Like I got this Tony Robbins book. I have, you know, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, you know, books by Steve Harvey. Um, so there's just so much. And that was like the, the, that opened the water gates for me to just dive into all of this, you know, developing myself. Um, so that's, that's why, because that book is what changed my life. <laughs> I promise you, whoever is listening to the book, even though I can't think of an excerpt from the book, it was a life-changing book. So if you are looking for one to read, read that book. I'm probably going to read it again. You've re-inspired me to read it again. So, yeah. <laughs> and I just found it fascinating when I was doing my research because that would not be a name I would expect someone like you to recognize. And that's not to say you don't know, like you have no knowledge of old school stuff, but it's like Ben Stein. That's a guy that folks, even from my generation might be more familiar with, but it made yeah. a, it made a mark with you. And even if you can't remember an excerpt directly, you said it changed your life. How did it change your thinking? It sounds like that book inspired you to make that transition into running your own businesses and making a name for yourself. Do you remember, he told a story with a shepherd. In, did you read the book? I haven't, I didn't know he did, but I'm, I'm gonna have to <laughs> look this up now because again, I have fond memories of him through yeah. Ferris Bueller, his other film appearances and when Ben Stein's Money where he got to play against type. Yeah, um, there was this story I am so disappointed in myself that I can't even remember it. Oh, uh, there was this story with like a, a, um, a shepherd. I can't remember. Um, basically though, it was, I'm gonna be honest, you put me on the spot. I'm embarrassed. I can't even remember. I just want to remind the audience that this woman is disappointed. <laughs> this high market closer, I should point out, is somehow disappointed. <laughs> yeah. I, Alexis, I think you have a lot to be proud of here. So even if you can't remember a specific book, I think that's okay. Being a high market closer that you are, 
no. you got a lot going for you. You, you, I gotta see now. I'm, I gotta remember. I need to. Um. I'm trying. I was trying to find the exact example. It was like with the shepherd. <laughs> You know what? Maybe you should start your own YouTube channel like Tia has. And so if you remember, then you can follow up on this podcast. We'll yeah. send a link. Here are all the stories that I forgot to tell you about. Right. Um, it was, it was. So the, the biggest thing that I can remember, it was just talking about just being diligent about your goals, right. And not letting other people's doubts get in your way. Um, I'm trying to think of what else was in it. Um, you know, have clearly thought out goals. Um, and then also it's like your will, your will to get somewhere is going to take you there. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, that just led, led me into even more, you know, research and information about just the power of our thoughts, right? The power of, I believe in manifestation, um, vision boards and all that. So this just has created that mindset of just continuing to grow, expand my knowledge. I'm, I'm a type of person who is very, you know, into being centered. So meditation, you know, creating that reality that you want. So it just opened the door to that. And on the subject of role models and idols, we talked a lot about Candace Parker. Besides her height, what was it about her game that inspired you when you were making your way up as an athlete? Uh, she was just so confident. She was like a leader. She took control of the game whenever she wanted to. Um, so I think it was just, it was so, it was how easy she was able to, you know, take control of the game, how easy she was able to, um, you know, and I felt like it's one of those things where she like moved the crowd. So I'm the type of person, I also, I enjoy people who can, you know, move people through their story or just through their action or just being. So she like, in a sense, if you look at it as a um, theater, like she could connect to the crowd, like she could move a crowd and make you feel emotions. Like you would get hyped. And that's the cool, that's the power of sports, right? It would, it can move you as a person. Um, but I think I just, I, I loved her performance of how she connected to the crowd, but then how could she, how she could take over the game when she wanted to. And it gave you and Caleb and Morris something to talk about. I know that was her favorite player as well growing up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I feel like that was like everybody's favorite player. Oh, um, Candace yeah. Parker was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Lindsay Whalen, Maya Moore, they often get thrown around. I've heard Elena Deladon once. Tia's favorite player was Becky Hammond. And I uh, wonder what happened to Becky. <laughs> I was, I, I'm teasing a little bit. Uh, sports fans, if you follow this, you know that she's part of the San Antonio Spurs coaching staff. But uh, oh yeah, yeah. I forgot you haven't followed sports as heavily, but that's okay. I tell you, like I have gone from like sports to now I'm everything diving into art. So with sports, I was just like, well, I'm trying to dive into video and and figure that out. So that's where my focus has been. Um, so <laughs> I hear you, but Hey, video, if you wanted to, could give you the window back into sports. When you think about all the mixtapes and highlight reels that you, even you put out, I imagine when you were a high school athlete. So, you know, there, we'll be ready to welcome you back when you're ready to get back in there. Yeah. I mean, I still like, I still play and I was always, I never really was like, I never watched that much like I watched it every once in a while I watched Candace Parker but I didn't just watch sports all the time um I just liked playing <laughs> fair enough and on the subject of manifestation people striving for more that is one reason you're a big Beyonce fan as I understand oh it. my gosh still to this day yep so I take it you saw the Lion King remake more than once I, I saw it a few times, saw it a few times, yeah. Well, Beyonce is a top choice for a lot of players in your generation. And so I can't say I'm her biggest fan, but I, I'm smart enough to know you don't mess with her because I don't want you or Jessica <laughs> January comes to mind or everyone else who looks up to Beyonce. I don't want this entire legion 
of yeah. women's basketball players <laughs> coming yeah. for me. You know what I mean? Wise, a wise man you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that smart, but that is one moment where I'd like to think I am. <laughs> So Alexis, I know we've covered a lot of ground, but are there any other hobbies or interests that you have that people wouldn't necessarily know about if they met you for the first time? Mm. Um, hobbies or interests, I'm still huge into fitness, nutrition. That's still something I'm very big in, but it'll go back to it again. I am all things filmography. Like I'm diving into to video content. Um, I'm also getting into photography. So, you know, people don't know that because it's new. So I guess that would be something, you know, people wouldn't know about me. On the subject of video, it sounds like you have a real interest of turning that passion into something of substance. Yeah. I've worked in that field for over a decade. What led you to take up video and content creation? Um, so for me, it was like, when I was younger, my brother and I used to make um, home video skits all the time. So it was something we always did when we were younger. Um, I also was acting for a little bit, so I enjoyed acting. So it was just, you know, getting behind the camera. Uh, so, I don't know, I guess it's just something I've always had interest in. But like I said, when I was playing basketball, it was everything sports. So now it's just, I'm in a place where this is what I can focus on and this is what I'm finding joy doing. So, you know, here I am. What do you see yourself? What would you like to contribute as a video producer? You, you go from exploring this topic, this category with you and your brother, and now you, know, you want to add that to your repertoire. Mm -hmm. How do you see yourself growing and evolving with a video platform? Uh, there's a lot of things that kind of interest me right now. So um, one is storytelling. Um, so I'm really interested in storytelling, not you know, not just like, you know, movies and whatnot. I, I have this docu-series in mind that I'm, you know, playing around with. Um, and then also with businesses, small businesses. So being an entrepreneur, I come across a lot of people who, you know, they have small businesses they're trying to get off the ground. So I'm in a sense trying to help small businesses develop their story and use video content to bring that brand awareness. Um, and then also create, you know, a digital media strategy for that. So helping create content using their story um, to further, you know, build that awareness for their brand. So it's part marketing, part self-help, if I'm understanding you correctly, as far as what you want to do with video or tutorials, kinda, I should say, like, like, yeah, I mean, kind of in a sense, I want to, yes. So there's two parts to it. It's part, you know, the business aspect of helping people with their, with their business, using their story. But in terms of the art form, I want to, you know, do some docu series. Like I'm, I'm really, I've really been interested in. Obviously, you can maybe tell that I'm trying to figure out, you know, this creative aspect. Like, where does that come from? How do people find that outlet? Um, so I kind of want to dive into that and focus on that a little bit. Um, and I'm still playing around with that idea, so it's not complete. Well, the best part when it comes to video that I've learned over the years, you can explore anything. So you right. can try brand awareness, you can explore that. And over time, maybe you add sports or another category. Right. The world is your canvas when it comes to video. And what I love most about it is how you can make something out of nothing, whether it's highlight reels, documentaries, you were talking about that yeah. a while ago. And I'm curious what subjects you would want to explore if you decided to take on documentary mm -hmm. production um yeah so that was like i was saying it, that has to do with people and their art so kind of just diving into that the history of it um and then seeing people currently in it so i don't have so i have the the idea in my mind i don't have the framework to be able to describe it but it has to do with people in their art <laughs> 
And from a personal perspective, I know I've been offering tips to Tia, who is launching her own video platform through her unfinished business yep. brand. So I'm all about helping people tell stories, whether it's in sports or any other category. Yeah. This may be hard to describe, Alexis, because you talk about being your own boss, setting your own hours, but what would you like to do? What would be your dream scenario with this foray into entrepreneurship that includes high market closing, video content? You know, it sounds like you want to be the most versatile entrepreneur you can think of. Um, yeah. So in my mind, how I envision it is, you know, ideally I would focus on you know, helping businesses with video content creation or, you know, creating a digital strategy for their business um, and using video. But then also, you know, it's twofold because then I also want the other aspect of, aspect of creating documentaries, creating, you know, films and whatnot. So I actually, you know, in my mind, it's, I would be doing two things. I'd be doing, you know, movies and docu-series and the other aspect I would be doing you know, digital branding strategies for businesses. So I got to. <laughs> Since we have talked about some of your role models, Ben Stein and Beyonce and Candace Oprah. Parker. What, who else? I said, and Oprah. <laughs> and Oprah, okay. Well, yeah, you left Oprah out of that article <laughs> that was written about <laughs> you a couple of years ago. But We've talked about your role models and how they have helped you as an athlete, as mm -hmm. a businesswoman. And earlier we spoke of the impact of having Jackrabbits, women's basketball fans come up to you and say how cool it was to see a woman of color playing division one basketball. Mm -hmm. Throughout your experience in athletics and the professional world, how do you think that will help you become a role model for others? Um, so how will my experience um, from South Dakota State help me become a- Well, just your whole life story, because it sounds like you took inspiration from the role models from Parker and Oprah, yeah. Ben Stein, Beyonce, you've taken inspiration from them. And now it sounds, from what you're telling me, you've already started to become an inspiration for others from that story you mentioned it's not Dakota State, but I have to imagine as you are building your platform, your reach is going to only expand. So how do you think that presents you as a role model? You know, it's so funny. I was just thinking of this like a few hours ago, trying to brainstorm, like what do I want to, what is my purpose or vision that I'm trying to show the world? Um, so bear with me because I, I, I've been saying it out loud, trying to figure it out. Um, but I guess essentially what I want to be able to do is show people and help people to understand that they can really do, if they have a desire in their heart to do something, they can do it. And just because they feel like they don't have like a natural talent to it doesn't mean you can't do it, right? It's about, you know, educating yourself. It's about gaining the knowledge to be able to see it through. Um, so, you know, also understanding that your story or honoring your story because everybody has a story, right? Um, and everybody has a purpose and a reason for being here. So just understanding that you don't have to you know, stay in this place. Uh, maybe it's working a nine to five. You don't have to do that if that's not what you want to do. It's just having the confidence that you can um, do something significant in, in that area of desire that you have in your heart. So I don't know. I probably didn't say that right because I'm still trying to figure out the words for it. But ultimately, I just want people to know, like, you don't have to have a natural talent towards something. It's about having a desire to do something and then figuring out how to do it, getting the education on how to do it. Well, Alexis, as I tell a lot of my guests on this podcast, there are no wrong answers. So mm -hmm. maybe you didn't say it the way you wanted to, but I think you got the point across. 
I hope so. <laughs> there is, I might have to hit you up for advice when we're done because <laughs> I've been trying to make a name for myself and it's not easy. And as you may find out getting into video mm -hmm. and media production, it is a grind and it's more cutthroat than I like to be as a person. I'm all about helping others tell their stories or giving people opportunities. Maybe if I were more territorial, things would be different, but that's just not my nature. And yeah. it sounds like that's not your nature either. You want to build yourself up, but help others along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I come from a place of abundance. I feel like the more you give, the more you will receive as well. So the fact that you're, you know, getting on here and trying to give people a voice for their content, that ultimately is going to turn around and help you and, and allow you to grow in so many ways. So if you come from a place of abundance and a place of service, you know, ultimately things will grow from there. And when it comes to growth, I'm going to say you've done a lot of that in this last year, navigating the pandemic. <laughs> We've lived through George Floyd and the subsequent protests. Yeah. We went through a very volatile week last week. We have gone through a lot of situations that have tested us in so many ways that we never could have imagined this time last year. It hasn't been comfortable to say the least, but how would you say this last year with everything we've had to adapt to, with everything we've been exposed to, how do you think that has helped you grow and strengthen your resolve to be a voice for others that want to get into business and a voice for other people of color that you can create those same opportunities. If you don't like what you're seeing, then you don't have to wait for something to happen. You can actively be a part of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I will say this. I, I feel like my faith has grown during this pandemic. Um, so I will say, you know, this pandemic has allowed me to step back and, and realize that, you know, just like I'm trying to tell people, you know, do what really moves you, right? Don't just do something for money, do something that moves you. Um, so, and, and be in alignment. Um, so I guess this pandemic has allowed me to step back, kind of get in alignment, get in alignment with what God has for me. Um, and then also grow from there to be able to speak and feel confident in whatever I say. If I felt it on my heart to say it, then I'm going to say it. Obviously, I'm not going to say anything reckless, like I have a filter, but also to be okay with like, you're not going to say something that pleases everybody. Um, and, you know, with this pandemic going on, with the social unrest going on, you know, this is just a time for people to, you know, just like, just listen, right? It's just about listening. What have, what have people been asking for for so long, right? So I think this pandemic has caused people to stop and have to listen. Um, so just use your voice, continue to use your voice and say what you feel is on your heart to say. Um, come from a place of service to help people. Um, and then also for me, like I said, being in alignment with what God has for me and not worry about other everything else. If I'm if I'm walking down the path he has put me, put me down, then I'm I'm good. We've covered a lot of ground, so this may seem like a silly question in light of that, but is there anything else about your journey, your story that you would like to touch on? Um no, I guess when it comes to if we talk about basketball and the significance of, you know, sports and how that has impacted us, I will give a shout out to the to the the men who have like for us at least like my dad, Percy, Jamal, Nelson, all them, um Tracy, Martin, you know, all those people, Greg, you know, they have they have created this environment. I feel like they're the ones who help create um, this this strong knit um, sisterhood that we have that have kept us together, that have you know pushed us to want to um, you know make the right decision, go play college ball. We always felt like we had somebody in our corner. Even when I was at South Dakota State, if I felt some type of way, well, I could call my dad, but I could also call Jamal or Tracy. Like they would listen to me and give me sound advice. Um, 
and those guys were there. They were like fathers for all of us. Um, so I think that's why we felt like a family because it wasn't just the girls. It was also, we had, you know, these guys who are our coaches, um, Tara, she was there too. And then our moms, you know, so we had that community because of our parents created that for us. I'm glad you brought that up because before we started the recording, Alexis, you asked me what got me into women's sports. <laughs> And that's been a long time. It's been a long time since anyone has asked me that. I've been at this for over a decade now. So most folks just know that I'm willing to give women's athletics a platform. Mm -hmm. But to go off your answer, it takes everyone to recognize that your parents understood the value of women's sports. And after Kobe Bryant's death, around this time last year, you may recall Ellie Duncan sharing a story, a conversation she had with Kobe and how he was proud to be a girl dad. And that led to a trending hashtag on social media. And one reason women's sports has made the progress and gains that it has, and you have benefited from it, are not just athletes like yourself, but the men who see, recognize the value and understand that just because you're a woman doesn't make you any less significant. Mm -hmm. And I know so many men who like women's basketball more anyways, because they say it's like more fundamental. Um, so it's just funny. Like it's a preference, right? If you're, it's just a preference. But yes, there's been so many, you know, men who have also, you know, helped take this to the next level. Um, so yeah, we wouldn't, it's, it's a, it's a community, right? We all, it's a family. We all got here together um, and paved the way for more people to come up. Right. What you did on the court was the biggest step forward and how that resonated, how that struck a chord with everyone in your support network, that plays a role too. That is funny. I don't go pulling people, but I'm proud to say that in my network, mm -hmm we all enjoy the sport. It doesn't matter who plays. I yeah. do cover men's games. I've covered boys games, the Minneapolis North team for the last few years. So I got to see Tyler Johnson before he became an NFL wide receiver. I've covered some of the big names at Hopkins, Minnehaha yep. Academy, and I wouldn't want to leave them out at no, the expense. Right. <laughs> and, but that's me. I, I've often joked that my biggest regret is not being able to cover more teams because, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to say that I got to cover the likes of Jalen Suggs and Trey Holloman, Tyler Johnson, Amir Coffey on the men's side and on the women's side, Paige Beckers, uh, got to see Tia and Kayla. I regret that I didn't get a chance to cover you more <laughs> often, uh, but that was years ago. Tia and I had this conversation too on how much the spotlight has changed. You know, now that Snapchat and Instagram are more common, you have oh, yeah. overtime, all of these accounts that are dedicated to highlights of games, who knows if you were growing up now, maybe you get more exposure, but at the same time, you don't get to be part of the trailblazing program at South Dakota State. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think, you know, grew up at the right time. There's so much social media, there's good and there's bad, right? Sometimes it's too much exposure. So, you know, I, I'm happy with the time I grew up in. <laughs> yeah, there is a part of me that wishes I didn't have to be so reliant on it. But as you're going to find out when it comes to media, that's just part of the game. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. You can regulate it. You can make sure it doesn't overwhelm you, but you know, you've got to keep that the social media presence active. Uh, that's how I got a hold of you and so many other guests actually are Facebook, Instagram, all of that. So yeah. there's a place for it, but yeah, I just, I love basketball and I'm looking forward to the day where I can get back out there and cover games in person again, uh, because I've enjoyed getting to meet so many coaches and players past and present yeah you're one of them 
you were an outstanding player in high school. You were a solid player. You got to start 56 games at South Dakota State. Maybe you weren't the leading scorer all the time, but you got to bask in opportunities and moments that others dream about, getting the chance to play in the tournaments. And now you're using that to propel yourself as a businesswoman, an entrepreneur, as a multimedia specialist, right. as a, you explore that realm. And I often say these podcasts give me a greater respect for my guests than I had before we recorded. And I don't say that in terms of throwing shade. I obviously respected you as an athlete and from the AAU stories I heard from your teammates, but hearing more about you and your hopes, your dreams, what you want to do. <laughs> I'm only a bigger fan of you now, Alexis, as a result. <laughs> so I hope you're happy. Oh yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll leave you with this for others. We've talked about you, Tia Albert doing the same thing and to know a way getting into modeling. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of you from that AAU group are establishing yourselves in terms of brand awareness for anyone out there, whether they're a high school athlete, just got out of college or have thoughts about promoting themselves. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give them? In terms of promoting themselves? Well, yeah, promoting themselves, their talents. I think you get yeah. where, you, you know where I'm getting at. Yeah, definitely. Um, one, realize, and I guess this is something everybody says, realize what you put out there sticks. So be cognizant of what you're putting out there. Um, what image, how do you want people to view you, right? What's the tone that you're putting out? Um, but then also, you know, be authentic. I feel like don't try to fit in with what you see um, on social media, just be authentic to you. Um, and when it comes to putting out, you know, film and whatnot, I definitely do that. Get more exposure, use these platforms if you can to get your, your film out there, um, get in front of coaches. Um, and then also when you're looking at what schools to go to, make sure you're actually asking the hard questions, right? Coaches want you. So do the work, like do the research. Don't just go somewhere just because it's, you know, your first offer. Um, so, yeah. That last answer reminded me of Tia's story. I had her on my podcast and she spoke of that process and how she would have done things differently. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with that a lot now as we see athletes move around at the high school level, the college level. I've always said sports is a business in that sense. So if you feel like making a move is the best choice, go for it. Mm -hmm. I also feel that some athletes maybe haven't come to terms with what you said, as far as mental health, their instincts, their own feelings. Some of them may not have been challenged before, and it's a lot to manage. We're getting a better glimpse of that now. So I'm glad you put that out there because we're becoming more aware of it and that's not going to change when this pandemic is over. Yeah. And people, it's just like, it's just realizing that basketball is only one aspect of your college experience. Um, so if you go somewhere based solely on basketball, you odds are you're going to regret it. Right. Because you know, what happens when, you know, maybe things aren't going well on the court or at practice. You want to be able to have a place where you can feel comfortable and still ex escape to. Um, so just be cognizant. Don't only just take in the basketball aspect, take in the whole experience, take in, you know, the campus, the students around you, um, the community around you, the education, right? You want to make sure it's a good education. It's not just about the, the basketball. Make sure you're going to learn some good stuff. Um, so, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what milestones you reach as you continue your career. And Alexis, since I've had, you're the third member of the North Tartan AAU team. Woo -woo. Uh, of the legendary AAU team. <laughs> 
I would love to have a reunion of sorts, maybe through Zoom, where we get all of you on just to share some stories, not just from the AAU circuit, but to- I don't know if you want that. That could well, be a little crazy. <laughs> well, for me, that's why I want to do it because it would be crazy fun, but I think it would highlight just how all of you have used that as a platform, a springboard mm -hmm. to launch your own careers and- everyone I've talked to speaks fondly of what everyone else has done yeah. with Tanoa and her modeling, uh, Chase. I forget exactly what she does, but I know she, I think works as an advocate for the underrepresented communities. If I remember correctly, you and Tia becoming entrepreneurs mm -hmm. in a field where there aren't a lot of minorities. Right. And the two of you are actively attempting to address that. You said Madison Lee doing the same thing. Maddie's killing it. Everybody should go check out Vintage Garden. <laughs> That's why I think it'd be fun to have another get together. It would probably be in virtual form because of the distance. <laughs> yeah. You know, with Tia in Dallas and Kanisha all over the place. But just to highlight how you've all stayed the same, how your connection hasn't changed a bit, but yeah. how you've all grown and become even stronger women, mm -hmm. even though some of you don't play the sport regularly anymore. Like that hasn't changed the fact that you are strong willed, determined women. And I guess that's what keeps you coming back to women's sports is I get to see women who aren't afraid to be themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to thank you for sharing just a snippet of your own story. I'm sure there's more we haven't touched on that we'll explore either through your own accord or through other interviews, but okay. I'm glad we did this, Alexis, and I hope we get to do this again. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate you having me on. And if you want to share your story on this podcast, on a future taping, just hit us up on social media at the Mike Peden on Twitter or Instagram. All you need is a good story and we'd be happy to share it. We're certainly happy to share part of Alexis's story. And until next time, thanks for watching.